Good evening, everyone. So uh, I'm going to be very brief, initially to set up the event and do a very brief introduction for all the speakers today, uh, after which the speakers will make an initial presentation of about seven, six, seven minutes, and we'll then open the floor up for Q&A. So as they're speaking, if you could please you know, take down questions, put down your thoughts somewhere so that we can do a Q&A at the end. Uh, just as a reminder, this event is also being broadcast as a webinar, and we will have participation and hopefully Q&A from those people as well. So um, the COP26 event is ongoing right now in Glasgow. Uh, a lot of world leaders have gathered there, making commitments and talking about climate change. Uh, as I was preparing for this event, I was trying to go through the report that came out this August by the Intergovernmental Pact of Council Climate Change, IPCC. And there was one sentence in it that stood out for me, which I haven't read. It is point number B5 in the report. It's a 40 page report, basically a summary for the policymakers in what I read. The point says, quote, many changes due to the past and future greenhouse gas emissions are irreversible for centuries to millennia, especially changes in the ocean, ice sheets, and the global sea level. So, there are many things in that report that cause concern and worry, but this one really stood out to me in the sense that if we can stop doing everything today, some of the changes are already in motion and cannot be reversed or stopped. Uh, on an average, it seems a 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius warming seems to be the course that we're on if we don't change our direction. So with that, I'll get into the event itself. I really want to thank some people before we get started. Uh, this has been, this has taken a lot of effort in terms of planning and, you know, getting the audience that we have today. Um, this event is originally is being conducted by the International Studies Department program, but it is also co-sponsored. And I'm going to thank the other departments that co-sponsored the Environment Studies, um, Global Health, Earth and Environmental Sciences, Economics, the Refugee Advocacy Collective, the DU Green Team, the LISCA Center for Intellectual Engagement, all of them have helped us in promoting this event and supporting it in many other ways. Um, the event initially came about because it was discussed in an international studies faculty meeting. Chris was one of the people who initially suggested it. I want to thank him. And Megan, who is our AAA, has been very helpful in all the logistical things and doing the great food that is awaiting you on as you come in here. So, to introduce our speakers, uh, very quickly, I'll be very brief. You know them all. They're all from Denison. Dr. Jonathan Maskett, Professor in Philosophy, Environmental Studies and Philosophy, Politics and Economics. He teaches courses in Aesthetics, Continental Philosophy, Environmental Philosophy, the History of Philosophy, the Philosophy of Technology, and other areas. So that's Dr. Maskett. Um, the second speaker today will be Dr. Eric Clemetti. He's a professor in Earth and Environmental Sciences. Geosciences, Environmental Studies, and Journalism. Dr. Clemeni is a volcan volcanologist, petrologist, and teaches classes on the rocks and minerals that make up the planet, along with the magmatic processes that lead to volcanic eruptions. Our third speaker today is Dr. Sarah Sapp, who's a professor in data analytics and environmental studies. She's an ecologist who uses data analytics techniques to study biodiversity in a changing world. Um, our fourth speaker today is Dr. Stephen Geroy, Professor of Economics, Environmental Studies, International Studies, and Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. Uh, Dr. Geroy is an eco ecological economist whose research examines intersections among neoliberal ideology, local and global governance, nationalism, education, climate change. And then our fifth speaker today is Dr. Chris Cruz, Professor in International Studies. His work is focused on the intersections of social and environmental justice and indigenous rights through the lens of the Anthropocene, with special attention to issues of land and agrarian struggles uh, in Nepal in particular. So that is our uh, panelists that make up the roundtable for today. 
Uh, once again, please take down your questions as they're speaking, uh, and we'll do hopefully a good conversation at the end because I do think there's a lot of people in the audience as well who I'd like to hear from, as you know, once the speakers are done. So with that, I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Master. Thank you. Delta. Somehow naughty that meant to mask. <laughs> Um, so I will uh, try to keep this to the six or seven minutes. Um, uh, the, the questions that they were given are rather expansive, and I suspect all of us will struggle with the app. We'll talk about all of us. So, um, um, so the, the colors have changed on this from what I think. All right. So, yes, so I'm going to skip this slide, actually. I'm going to start with two quotations from the first, from President uh, George W. Bush, George the first. Yes. Uh, George H. W. Bush, uh, who attended the Rio um, and Earth Summit sponsored by the UN in 1992. Um, the first of these is probably known as a number of these. Um, the American way of life is not up for negotiation, period. Um, if that's your beginning point, um, then I think we're done. Um, and that's the point of what I have to say today. Um, they, um, Next that we have is, is we believe that the road to Rio must point toward both environmental protection and economic growth, environment and development. By now, it's clear to sustain development, we must protect the environment, and to protect the environment, we must sustain development. So these two things go hand in hand. Um, and, and as an environmental philosopher, I think one of the areas that I would most want to question is the place of economic growth in our thinking today. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. I want to point as well to a book that was really influential on me early on in my career by Ed and Ness, um, whom I used to refer to as Norway's most important living philosopher um, until he died. Um, until he um, but he might be arguably Norway's most important 20th century philosopher. Um, and he wrote this book in 1976 called Ecology, Community, and Lifestyle. And, and the book is a very large and complicated uh, ex ex um, presentation of a view that has come to be known as ecology. Ness was one of the founders of the deep ecology movement, one of the most important theorists of deep ecology. Um, it would take me quite a long time to explain to you what deep ecology is. So I'm actually going to do what they tell you never to do. And I'm going to talk just about the title of the book, these three words, ecology, community, and lifestyle, because I think they lie at the heart of how we need to think about global warming. And we'll notice that one of President Bush's words, lifestyle, which is prominently in the title, um, but the other economic growth doesn't, and, and economic growth actually comes in for quite a lot of criticism in Ness's book. Um, so here, right, philosophers are in the business of, of asking questions. We're not necessarily in the business of answering questions. Um, we try, um, but you think we're trying to show why things are more complicated than people think that they are. Why things are trying to offer distinctions that can be drawn to help us speak. Clearer in our thinking, um, but we're often not. Um, we often find ourselves unable to provide clear answers that don't lead to further questions. So these are just some of the questions that I think that we would need to ask in an era in which the globe has already gotten warmer, in which the globe is going to continue to get warmer, um, and in which, um, in all honesty, we are not doing enough to address these issues. So my first question is, will technological changes be sufficient to address global warming? I think one of the premises of a lot of the conversation we have about global warming is that these are simply technical problems and we just need to develop new technologies and things will be fine. And I think it's worth our asking the question, is that true? Second question, is economic growth compatible with addressing global warming, President? Um, President Bush insisted that they were that they were compatible with each other. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, we might want to ask some further questions about economic growth. Um, um, is economic growth necessary to provide employment? This is one of the main reasons or justifications given in favor of having a growing economy is that it's necessary to create employment. Um, I'm not 
even remotely convinced that it is true that that is the best or the only way to create employment. Um, we might ask as a subsidiary question, is economic growth necessary for human happiness? Um, we take it as a given that more stuff is, right? Those who have more are necessarily happier than those who have less. Um, I don't know if it's true or not. Um, we might think further about economic growth, which for environmental reasons, is it even morally justifiable to engage in an economy that grows in the way that ours does? And though we might ask third and final question, is it acceptable to distribute environmental farms to some and the benefits of those farms to others? Um, that those who live in Cancer Alley and you live in a place that's Cancer Alley, you know that's good, right? So this is the southern, southern Louisiana with little petrochemical plants, right? And people who live in there are largely poor, largely black, um, has cancer rates much higher than um, the population in general. But the benefits of those environmental harms accrue to those who don't live there. So is that a just thing, better, a morally acceptable thing to do? Um, so should we do something about global warming? So I think I think we should, right? If we think that global warming poses an existential threat to humanity, and there's reason to believe that it does. Right? By existential threat, I just mean it might drive us to extinction. Uh, um, right? um, and perhaps it poses an existential threat to nature, but the question what is nature is too big and too complicated for me to talk about. So whatever nature is, um, maybe that too is under threat, although I'm less sure of that. Um, and if we think of the continued existence of human life, and again, perhaps of nature, whatever that is, it's a good thing. And we might not think that the existence of human life is a good thing. But if we do, then are we morally obligated to do something about global warming? So it's only if we think that, that there is, right, that human life is worth something that we should do something about it. I think we do, but we could agree, disagree about that. So then the question is if we are so morally obligated, what should we do? Um, and I think it's just, this is the point where philosophers, philosophers are going to ask questions, but also too good at imagining answers to these questions. So it seems to me that if we think about global warming, we can imagine probably three different ways we might deal with it. So first is to do nothing. That's business as usual. We'll just ignore it. Um, that for me is a non-starter, but, but that is a possible response, and it's the easiest response, at least in the short term. The second is to try to address it through technological change. I'll talk about these in a little bit more detail. Um, and the third, the one that I think is the most interesting and maybe the most important, but the one that is least talked about in, um, in a lot of discussions about climate change is thinking about lifestyle changes. Right? And so we're going to have to talk about what, what that might be. So, Business as usual, I think, is straightforward. So let's ask the question, what would it look like to live sustainably? Right? My, the research project that I work on is called probably the aesthetics of sustainable living. Like, just ask this question, what would it look like to live sustainably? We are all familiar in our daily lives with what it looks like to live unsustainably, right? So what would it look like for us to live sustainably? One way it might look is to embrace various technological solutions. So what would that mean? That would mean looking for energy efficiencies and material efficiencies. So we'll people talk about recycling. Recycling is a form of materials efficiency because it's easier to produce new aluminum <coughs> products from recycled aluminum than it is to go and dig out bauxite and run electricity for them to separate the aluminum from bauxite to make aluminum. Right? Um, energy efficiency means getting a car that drives that goes further on any unit of energy or something like that. Um, we might look for cleaner energy production. Um, I suspect that everybody is familiar with the, the least um, clean form of energy production, which is burning coal. Um, but burning diesel isn't much better. Um, burning natural gas is somewhat better. Um, not burning anything would be better than either of those. Um, but not burning anything um, has its limits, right? So now we're talking about wind power, solar power, um, tidal power, um, et cetera. Um, 
technological solutions might need some form of carbon capture, right? So we released all of this CO2 into the atmosphere. A lot of that is already going to absorb into ocean waters. Um, there are folks who are going to try to carbon capture that and do something with it, right? Because the carbon was already captured. That's what it was in the wood and the coal and the petroleum and the gas. That was captured carbon and we freed it by burning that stuff, right? So can we recapture the carbon? Um, there is, there's been a lot of work on like global shading. This question is, could we just fill the atmosphere with various chemicals that would last for some amount of time? This is a moral thing to do, et cetera. Um, and then the last thing that people talk about is nuclear power. The nuclear power, nuclear power, everybody hates nuclear power, right? Nuclear power lowers carbon controls. Maybe that would be a good thing to do. My take on all of this is that even when I've looked at this, I don't think there is remotely enough in all of these technologies for us to get to where it is that we think the scientists tell us we need to get. That's my take. So then we have lifestyle solutions. And these are, I think, are the, the other ones. So number one, right, so these are just three. I thought I had four on the slide. Um, one is dietary change. Um, uh, the American, so when President Bush talked about the American way of life, one of the fundamentals of the American way of life is that we eat an awful lot of meat and dairy products. Um, and there is no way around it. The production of meat and the production of dairy are major contributors to global warming. Um, in particular, eating cows and sheep is or even consuming dairy products from cows and cheese is really bad because they felt part of methane, and methane is a much worse global warming gas than CO2. So if you want cows to be producing less methane, you should probably have fewer cows, right? There's many cows because we like to eat them and we like to eat the milk that they produce and the cheese that we think we like. So maybe that would be a pretty big lifestyle change for a lot of people is eating maybe not no meat, but eating less meat, maybe eating or locally, etc. Um, a second lifestyle solution, and this is a lot of my work, it has to do with how we live in terms of transportation and density and, and planning. And if you spend time around Randall, you get outside the northern Randall, so there's a cancer goal to develop a house on less than five acres of land. Now, there's a stuff there you can get around some subtle way, but I don't think I can get into that, right? But if you build big houses on big, big pieces of land, that everybody is committed to driving everywhere. Right? How do you get people not to drive? Well, it's really easy to say, you should drive less, right? Most are, but it's really hard to drive less if the world is built and it's built. And then the third one is lifestyle simplification, right? That we live lives that are oftentimes about having more stuff, having new stuff. Um, the entire fashion industry is predicated upon our always having new things. Um, we like to travel, we like to engage in all sorts of recreational activities, and all of those things might be problems. Right? So I want to conclude by talking about what I think of as like when, when people hear environmental philosophy, they tend to think environmental ethics. And I have never really identified as an environmental ethicist because I think ethics is insufficient because ethics has to do with individuals and individual actions. You could change your whole life as an individual, and if nobody else changed, it wouldn't make any difference at all. Individual actions are simply insufficient. I'm not saying they're not important, but they, they are so minuscule in their effect that we have to look at collective actions, which means we need to look at politics rather than ethics. Um, philosophers have a long, have a long, have a long history of being known as big farmers. Um, and so to keep that to this slide, I'm going to end. I'm a big farmer here. Um, our situation is tragic. Tragic means that bad things are going to happen, and those bad things are inevitable. And those bad things are inevitable no matter what. Either we're going to keep living as we have lived, and the planet will get hotter and hotter and hotter, and at a certain point, our civilizations are going to collapse, or we're going to change, have to change drastically how we live. And that means for a lot of us a sense of loss and that there will be things that we love that we can't do anymore, right? And we'll all you know, I used to love going skiing, right? And now maybe I can't go skiing. I used to love being able to see my family a lot. I love to do this, I love to do that, right? Whether it's shopping or whatever, 
our lives. I just don't see any way around this. Um, and that's tragic and that's sad. And we need to acknowledge that. But I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Before we started, Jonathan said something about being worried if our messages are going to be similar. Uh, so he should be. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm. Whoa. <laughs> I am coming uh, from the perspective of the earth and environment sciences. Um, and the earth sciences have a really complicated place in all this <coughs> discipline. We can kind of be seen as the source of and solution to this climate change crisis because the modern discipline of geology, which is the core of the earth science side, the earth and environment sciences, um, was really born out of the search for these hydrocarbon energy sources. Uh, William Smith's map made in the early 1800s, a map of England, was designed to look for coal uh, to power the Industrial Revolution. And we can't look back at William Smith and say that he should, be, should have expected that his map of the rocks of England would sort of inexorably lead to planetary jeopardy. But that's kind of where we are. We are built as a discipline off of this search for resources. And we have expanded and grown and changed since then. But we have to acknowledge the fact that we played a role in causing this problem. We played a role in identifying that the problem existed. And we play an important role, I see, if we go all in to prepare society for the results of all this. Because you know, we're in a crisis, it's quite clear. Uh, this is just an example from last, uh, early 2020, where uh, Australia was you know, on fire. Uh, and that fire is the result of these changes in atmospheric circulation, changes in climate that uh, made it hotter and drier and it's clear that this problem, you read that IPCC report, it's very clear that this problem can only have one specific cause. And it's not coming as Kate Marvel, like Kate Marvel says here, it's not the sun, it's not volcanoes, it's not natural cycles. It's people, we're dumping carbon into the atmosphere, we're making it bad. So we can choose to ignore results like this, or we can figure out how to alleviate the potential future scenarios and mitigate the results of the bevy of sort of complicated and mostly depressing scenarios that we're being faced. So this spark diagram uh, from the LA Times, when using data from NASA, kind of shows that we are in a place where we are uh, in the red. We are in an irreversible, in human time scales. Time scales is an important issue when thinking about climate change. In human time scales, we are in a pattern where it's almost certain that this warming trend in the climate will continue. And everyone agrees. We should all hopefully know this in this room. At least every reputable scientific organization, and that includes liberal bastions like the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. <laughs> they all are on the same page that our extraction of hydrocarbons and then the burning of that uh, is the cause of the changing climate. Yet somehow the burden of proof still seems to lie with those of us who are been convinced by the data, people want to look for uh, the reasons why they shouldn't have to do anything and not the, all the myriad of reasons why we should. So how do we approach this? Well, you know, there's kind of a, something that when I, when I think about how this is approached by activists, by organizations, by uh, the media, you know, there's a tendency sometimes to kind of uh, sell this as uh, solutions and mitigation for climate change as an opportunity or a pleasure or something we should all be excited about. This whole idea is like, you know, we're told that all these, these great things that we can do individually 
that to help the environment. We told that recycling can be fun, walking and cycling is a joy. Uh, we can find the same excitement in staycations as we can in these far flung vacations we might be used to. But you know, humans are clever, probably a little bit too clever, where we can see this. It's kind of like your parents saying, oh boy, cleaning can be fun. <laughs> and it's just not the case. We don't believe it as a kid. And we're not going to believe it now. So, whatever, I am like most everyone else, probably. I like shiny metal objects that go fast. And I think that we get told that recycling is fun. And it's not. Doing donuts in a four by four, drinking gin, going to Tahiti, eating a steak, those things for most people are fun. And it is okay to say that they're fun, but they're also grotesquely irresponsible because facts. And we can embrace that sense of loss at the same time as we can um, move forward in trying to figure out what solutions we can do without sugarcoating it into the sense of this is something great that we can all look forward to. So we have, um, you know, climate change. Yeah, this is, um, we're looking at uh, the fact that a lot of people's minds are made up, whether the science says it or not. There is a worldview wedded in sort of a, a sense of cognitive dissonance that prevents real action. I mean, I hate it that climate change is true. I wish Bigfoot was real. Bigfoot would be a great guy to hang out with. But Bigfoot isn't real. Climate change is real. And it's a real and depressing thing. And the effects will be felt on you. So here we are. We are uh, people in a house. We might be saying, oh, you know, we smell fire and it's getting hot in here and we're having trouble breathing. And I have this theory that the roof is on fire. But you know, you're not going to bother to call the fire department until you have absolute proof that the roof is caving in on it. What kind of an approach is that? Why take this chance on the slim opportunity that the roof isn't on fire to do anything when? But in light of this overwhelming proof that it is on fire and calling the fire department is going to make sure that you don't manage. So really, we have some choices, right? We have hard choices. Uh, the choices are not going to be fun. They're not going to be a great opportunity. Yet across history, civilizations survive because they adapt to changing environments. The IPCC report makes it clear that we're hurtling down Kind of like we're on one of those carts in a rickety coal line, hurtling down until we're going to um, unlike, unlikely find the brakes are going to be working on this. And we have this climate inertia that's going to take us somewhere. So we have this choice to make between the path we're going to take. And instead of looking at ways to um, make it seem like the impact is not going to be that bad, we need to look at ways that we can reduce that impact that we know is inevitably going to happen. So we have this small chance that things might not be as bad as we expect, but most of the uh, scenarios are things are going to be as bad as we expect. So I'll sort of end with this idea that we have an alternative, potentially, to crashing head fast, uh, headlong into the wall, and that opportunity might not solve our climate change problem, but as a discipline of the earth sciences as well as a discipline, I think that we are in a position to make that crash less painful for as many people as possible. Thank you, uh, next speaker, Dr. Sarah Hi, make sure I don't. So I come from a background of studying ecology, I do ecological research, I'm in the data analytics program. So while my work isn't on climate change specifically, it is something that very much influences what I study which is global biodiversity change, the ways that plants and animals interact with each other, and the way they move around in their landscapes. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about what I think about climate change and what my discipline 
writ large and uh, have to say about it. So, so in my work, as I just mentioned, I do biodiversity research. I do this on a macro scale. So most of the work that I'm doing is looking at interactions between plants and animals and their movements and their changes in diversity at regional, continental, or global scales. Um, and so what we know from this work is obviously things are changing. And those changes are at times unpredictable and they are accelerating in many parts of the planet. So again, I don't study climate change directly in my work, but I do want to take a moment to just speak to it a little bit personally, because I think sometimes when we're thinking about climate change, it's, it's very difficult to think at scale. So when we're trying to think about something that is affecting the planet as a whole, what does, what does average temperature of the planet mean? I don't experience the average temperature of the planet. I experience the temperature in this room right now, right? And so sometimes that's hard to think about. We also, in climate change, are often talking about things that are happening on the scale of decades, centuries, or beyond. And so it's really difficult, again, just for human beings, individuals, to try to think about what, what does that change mean from change in my lifetime, in the generations before me, thousands of years before me, and going forward? And I think this is where sometimes we can either lose uh, hope about climate change or feel like there's this inability to even really think about it holistically and therefore what actions even matter, right? And so this is a slide that's going to be similar to probably many of the slides looking at kind of past change and reset. I just want to put some markers on here to think about it in terms of a lifetime, right? I have a hard time looking at this as a whole. So if I think about it just relative to when was I born, what are some of the milestones in my life, and perhaps the end of my life, and be optimistic here, put a marker up here to 100 years old because there are set periods in my family. You know, you can then start to kind of measure, imagine yourselves on this timeline as well. Where, where were you born? Where are you at now? How much change can you kind of track over to that y-axis to think about it? You know, so I have these dashed lines over here just between the time that I graduated high school and maybe when my children are hopefully going to graduate high school in the future, we're looking easily at probably another degree of change. And that's looking at this kind of bluish line, which is probably, it's not the worst case scenario, it's probably a more likely scenario, but really we're probably going to somewhere between that kind of purpley blue line and, and hopefully not, but possibly the red line. It's a lot of change just in 20 years-ish, 30 years. If I think about you know, my optimistic lifespan, I mean, the, even the blue line, even this idea that changes that we've made are, we've baked in a certain amount of change. I mean, I might experience in my lifetime three degrees change. That's, that's kind of scary to think about. But I think it helps put things into context a little bit. Um, for, I put the blue light or the green light on here to show that's kind of one of the most optimistic scenarios. We're still talking in my lifetime, I'm likely to experience a degree and a half or two degrees change in temperature at the global scale. This means, in, depending on where I live in the world, if I live further north, if I live in a, um, a higher latitude zone, which we do generally at this point in the United States. That change might even be larger. Right? I'm going to compare this to another set marriage I know, my grandmother. She lived to be 100 years old. This amount of change that she experienced in her lifetime is not insignificant, but it feels in comparison to what I will experience and what all of you would like to experience. You know, so, so, I mean, we're talking really big things here. But what I study is biodiversity change, so the impacts on plants and animals which is a critical data science problem because like climate change, the changes can be unpredictable, they're unevenly distributed across the planet, and we don't, in many cases, have enough data to have those really, really certain models, which means there's a lot of uncertainty in what we think will happen. It doesn't mean qualitatively, the outcome is any better or any different, which is, I think, where the miscommunication happens with the public sometimes. It's like, oh, we just think your models are wrong, and they're uncertain, maybe that means there's a chance this is happening. 
doesn't mean that. The, the direction is the same. It's the magnitude of the change that we aren't always able to pinpoint really clearly. Bio, as a biologist, I just want to repeat this thing you've probably have heard before. There's really only three things that living things can do when the climate changes. They can move somewhere else, they can adapt or evolve to those changes, or they can die. So when individuals die in response to climate, any other kind of change, that may reduce kind of the total abundance of the total number of that species, whether that be humans or plants or animals. And when all of them die, then we get to extinction, right? Most of the work that I'm doing is concerned with movement, and this is really the most ubiquitous form of biodiversity change plant animal response that we see. There are extinctions that are happening for all sorts of reasons on the planet, but what we do see everywhere is movement, redistribution of biodiversity and of species across the planet. This is the largest change we see, and I think it seems to be happening everywhere. So then the question becomes where is it happening? The close, or where are these redistributions, reshuffling species happening the most quickly? These, this is a map of just showing some of the data points globally, it's like 52,000 plus um, in some recent research that I've been doing. What do we see in this map though? There's still lots of gaps in where we have the data. We have the best information really in uh, Western and Northern Europe, across the United States. Um, maybe down around Australia. And there's tons of places we don't have good data. These are also consequently a lot of the places that we expect to see the largest impacts from climate change. So as you can see, this big map is really showing all of the um, overlapping threats of human, of the Anthropocene on, on the planet. So these are combinations of human population, land use, pollution, invasive species. Climate change is the one on the bottom left. You can see a lot of those changes are really focused in the global south. Uh, we don't have good biodiversity data there. We desperately need better data, especially because these are the places that are feeling the largest impacts of climate change. Um, we also know that things are changing more quickly in the ocean than they are on land, though they are changing everywhere. And so what we don't know yet is how much these kind of uneven redistributions of things that are starting to migrate to new places or migrate at different times are going to affect things on a region. And as different species change timing of the annual migration cycle, like birds, butterflies, insects, as well as things that are just wholesale changing where they live, where the range is, we also don't know yet where and how these will affect other species, including humans that might rely on those species um, for enjoyment, for tourism, <coughs> for sustenance, for all sorts of different things. Um, so the work is, that's needed is highly, highly collaborative. We just need more groups of people that can work together because, again, I'm going to echo these ideas. Collective action is where it's at, both from just the basic understanding of what is happening, what do we think will happen, but then the next steps of what are the policies, what are the ways of communicating or the changes that we also need to make or learn to deal with in order to move forward to what's happening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Quinton Carroll. All right. Um, okay. Uh, all right. I want to say a big thank you first to uh, the International Police Program for organizing this event. Thank you, Chris, and Megan, in particular, all the people for the work. So I want to share some. Thoughts about how economists think about climate change. Um, I don't know if each other pay sure if that's, that's okay. The joke you say it now. It's all white and a bit too much. Okay. Uh, all right. So we'll move on to our uh, next picture. But some of what I have to say, uh, there'll be some similarities with what Dr. Ness said, but not a surprise to you. He has a background in economics. 
All right. There's a picture here. So, uh, picture that's actually closer to home here. Uh, it's one of the few times, fortunately, uh, that the uh, Cuyahoga River even uh, burned um, in the 50s and 60s. But anyway, the, the question was, how do economists think about climate change? And I wanted to start with, when did you start thinking about it? Um, in fact, in the 60s, some economists were, were thinking, uh, but of course, the environment, um, uh, and but climate change. So there's here a little quote from an interesting essay by Paul, that you can use your favorite search engine, find the essay that's titled The Economics of the Coming Spaceship Earth. Um, but a very bottom-up quote, it says, the atmosphere may become people's major problem in another generation, at the rate at which we are filling it up with gone. That's a very scientific way to talk about what we're talking in the atmosphere. But this notion that something's going on, uh, as a matter of fact, a generation later, we create uh, the World Trade the FCC, uh, the UNFCCC, so that's the United Nations Framework Convention, which is proposed to COP26, uh, to the um, which is taking place right now in Glasgow, right? So it's set up with trade talk about climate change. So, um, another economist uh, also kind of calling on his colleagues to start being serious about waste, right? That's kind of the byproduct of everything we do, and of course, in particular, carbon dioxide being a uh, the waste product from industrialization. Um, so, more specifically, with uh, carbon dioxide and climate change, uh, two of the most <laughs> more well known economists are. Uh, an American economist, William Rompass, who, who actually uh, received the Nobel Prize for his work a couple of years ago, who, in fact, in 1975, asked the question, can we control carbon dioxide? Um, one of the things he, he did, he came up with this notion of actually two degrees Celsius threshold. That was an intuition he had that's now a major policy. So we've gone from an intuition more intuition on this science back in the 70s to more science on this intuition today. Um, but he also came up with the theoretical concept of social cost of carbon. And what is that? That's at the basis of carbon pricing, which is something I will discuss in just two minutes. Um, and he developed an extensive cost benefit analysis to figure out what is going to be the economic impact of more carbon emissions. Well, and should we do something about it? Um, so at the time, the same well, we should. Make some, take some moderate space uh, steps uh, to try to, uh, to take care of it. And right in back then, 40 some years ago, the same by 2020 is when we need to get serious about it. And guess what? Here we are now. Um, all right. <clears throat> so, more recently, this century, there's been a lot of work. Uh, you may have heard about the Stern, Stern Review, it's one of the most famous uh, economic analysis of climate change. Uh, it's a 700 page document, massive, um, uh, yeah, economic analysis to figure out what, what are the costs uh, of climate change and what should we do. And that part of the review says that back in 2007, the time to act is now, that's 15 years ago. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay. Picture doesn't show here either, but it's been uh, also very exciting. exciting. Um, where are we at as economists? I think. The majority of us, whatever our ideology or background, actually recognize that not enough has been done to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. In just a minute, we'll talk about ways that economists think um, about mitigation. But there is a consensus among economists, just like there's a consensus among scientists that there is an issue and we need to do something about it. Um, a couple of words here, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but what brings us together is the assessment report of the IPCC uh, that was released in, uh, in August. Uh, <laughs> colleagues of scientists talked about this. So, uh, just a, a note, there will be two more reports, one in February and one in March. Um, first report is on the physical science of things. The next report will be on uh, vulnerability and adaptation. So we are living in climate change. Right, there is still a little window of opportunity to limit the impact, but we have to live with it. So, how we adapt to a climate changed world 
Uh, the last report will be on mitigation pathways to, uh, to mitigation and we still can limit emissions. So uh, we limit the worst impacts of climate change. Um, okay, maybe Chris will talk about the last point here. But I want to give you some ideas about how economists. Um, um, how economists think about that. So I'm going to look at five different points here. Um, one is some economists think, all right, this is an existential threat. Okay, it's something that we've never seen before as a species. And so we need to mobilize like far against climate change. We need to uh, uh, kind of dismantle the fossil fuel infrastructure and invent a new economy that's not renewable, energy, nuclear power, electric vehicles, and so on and so forth. The idea that maybe I've enacted the New Deal that you've heard about, um, which then calls for our government to act dramatically, invest in the economy, to change um, the economy. Ideas behind the green growth that says that we need to leverage the financial sector, sustainable uh, finance, climate finance to change the economy. Um, a different viewpoint says no, maybe it's time to actually scale back, maybe stop growing or stop focusing on the world, particularly in the global north. Uh, the argument here is that uh, as we continue to grow, there's no evidence that we can limit our impact on the environment. Back more growth scale and there's more impact, more uh, carbon emissions. Okay, uh, and the point that uh, I believe just uh, made before uh, there is no evidence that well being has increased in many post industrial nations over the past 40 years, and yet income on growth income has doubled or tripled. So, why are we growing if we are not any happier than we were for decades ago? Okay, yet a different approach, maybe more policy based, saying. Um, maybe it's time to regulate differently. And they're pushing back a little bit on the notion of deregulation that has dominated kind of policy making over the past 40 years and saying, uh, if you look at what happened, the success you may have had with Enact uh, in water, they were due to regulation. And so why not reintroduce this smart, flexible regulation to tackle emissions uh, once again? All right. Maybe the most Prominent view among economists is still to try to put in place a market based approach. Okay, so it's putting a price on carbon emissions. We can do that, the carbon markets. We can do that, the carbon taxes. Right? And there are some examples of those in the period on a larger scale. And then finally, uh, the last approach, which uh, we already discussed a little bit, is geoengineering. Uh, here we talk about carbon capture as well as solar geoengineering. Uh, uh, and what I want to say here is so that carbon capture is capturing carbon without the source or direct capture, you suck it out of the air, removing the carbon. Um, solar geoengineering is on a much larger scale where you're managing solar radiation. So you see in clouds, uh, you spray sulfur dioxide particles in the stratosphere to prevent solar radiation from less of it uh, going on to Earth to limit uh, the warming effect. Now, what is important here, particularly in the context of COP26, that all of these pledges of net zero emissions have embedded in them some kind of geoengineering. Right? In particular, it says, and that's the net part of it, carbon capture will need to be a reality on a large scale. Of Any of those pledges is too late. At the moment, technology is not proven, not at a large scale, it's going to be high. And that raises the question of whether that could be All right. I'll leave you with uh, some thoughts here. Uh, society is still be transformed this century. The question is whether we want the potentiality of the century, we want to act, whether that's what way we want society to transform, or do we want to just react to uh, the next crisis to figure out what direction it is. Uh, I'm going to just leave it at that. Chris, thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Chris Cruz. Everybody, thanks for joining us here tonight. So, um, I want to start out with my research focus on social movement. So, some of the comments that were being made out in the streets over the last couple of days. I'm on the screen here, climate uh, superstar, the words, and no more blah, blah, blah. She's famously been saying in the last 
beliefs. And in part, they call attention to the fact that the political change that's happening needs to happen. And while some of it may take place inside COP26 meetings going on in Alaska right now, and ultimately the change will come from people on the street, particularly young people, and putting pressure on political leaders in order to address these issues. So if you look at a couple of the major reports that have come out, some in this past month, others in the last couple months, such as the State of Climate Action 2021, they looked at 40 different indicators about how we're going to stay under 1.5 degrees Celsius, and they found that none of the indicators that they are measuring look good. We're off track, we're well off track, the 17, three of them, three are actually going in the wrong direction, but some of the most important dealing with transportation and land use and coastal conservation and agriculture, and then nine of areas where we don't even have the data. Which raises a question about how useful is an indicator if you don't have data on it. That's a good point. And it notes in particularly that if we are serious about the zero carbon, Future, we need to increase a lot of things and decrease a lot of things. So, phasing out the whole like the five path that we're doing now, accelerating reforestation three times faster, and boosting crop productivity two times faster, which is increasingly important. We may think that by the end of the century, we're going to have an additional two billion people on the planet based on current population um, forecasts. And we need to increase climate financing at least 13 times faster to a, an average of about $5 trillion every year by 2030. And for those of you that are following the COP26 meetings, that was a big focus yesterday, issues of climate financing. And how do we do that? What would that look like? Um, similarly, the UN's emission gap report, which came out in this past month, says we're basically, even if we do everything we said we're going to do and we do it successfully, we're still heading towards about a 2.7 degrees Celsius rise by the end of the century, and as Sarah mentioned earlier, the less optimistic versions have that higher possibly. That means we need at least a 30% reduction in CO2 levels to stay under 2 degree, which is already much higher than a lot of people suggest we should be, and a 55% reduction to meet that Paris climate accords of 1.5 degree. And that net zero emission and the pledges to do that you know, if we act now and we actually fulfill all the various um, national climate plans and pledges that have been made previously and submitted or have been made in the last couple of days at the COP meetings, we still have a lot of work to do. So just to give you an example, this year, the total greenhouse gas emission will be about 60,000 gigaton equivalents, um, 33,000 gigaton equivalents just in CO2 alone, the rest can be methane and other problems. So if we want to keep under that 1.5 degrees Celsius rise from the Paris Accords, that means we need to figure out how to cut 28 gigaton CO2 equivalents um, in the next you know, basically eight or nine years, which um, seems hard to imagine considering we're increasing our carbon use, our energy use, our population numbers. All the trends are going up um, rather than down to that level. And importantly, as this and other reports have noted, um, there was a big push on this idea of build back better and using all of this COVID revitalization and COVID finance money to try to address um, climate issues, particularly questions of um, climate justice issues and vulnerable frontline communities. Um, but less than 20% of all the spending so far has gone to address anything related to carbon or emission reductions. And in fact, 90% of all that money that has been spent related to COVID relief essentially came from six big countries in the G20 um, and almost nothing uh, from the rest of the world. So another missed opportunity um, that we could have used the pandemic to uh, sort of chart a different political course, if you will. And similarly, the Reclaim Finance Report, which just came out last month, looking at all of these various uh, climate pledges in the name and what those uh, may mean in terms of actions on the ground, finance for multiple communities, indigenous communities, social communities, and what they found is we see the flood of net zero alliance sort of commitments and pledges. We saw this in the last 48 hours, Modi and others making these grand declarations. Um, there's now 300 or more financial institutions, which represent about a third of the entire global capital that's being invested. So I'm being led right now through GFAN, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which was launched in London to help coordinate some of these efforts. I and mean, then using the United Nations Race to Zero campaign as kind of the goals for thinking about financing. 
And they've said we need at least a hundred trillion dollars over the next 10 years um, to meet these goals. And that's supposedly what politicians have pledged to raise and donate at the top meetings in the last uh, day or two. Um, but what they found is if you look, what we're seeing is a lot of talk is they cleverly said net zero action. So we've got a lot of people saying, well, we need better analysis of the different emissions and impacts of investments. But they put in place no mandatory guidelines amongst all of the different net zero alliances to actually say, okay, so we know we need to stop investing in carbon, fossil fuels, and others, but we're not actually going to mandate that you do that within your plans and just think it's a good idea that you should do it. And similarly, there's a lot of loopholes in many of these pledges, whether they're official pledges or pledge uh, future contributions. And importantly, the basic UN framework for the race to zero itself, which all of these financial institutions are looking at, actually makes no mention of fossil fuels. So it's deeply problematic when you're guiding UN institutions that's thinking about climate financing, actually doesn't address not funding fossil fuels as what part of climate financing we must address. So it doesn't also require any kind of absolute emission targets. It just suggests the targets should be developed. And it, again, calls for voluntary action, which we've seen in the past is a uh, recipe for disaster in climate politics. And finally, they make it very clear that we need to stop financing for all fossil fuel developments um, and production. And similarly, even as you know, another bastion of liberal politics, the International Energy Association, IEA, you know, it has come out very clearly in their net zero by 2050 report and their world energy outlook. Saying that we need youth emission cuts, we know that the technology is already there and the policy is already there. It's political willpower that's the problem. Um, and as the one report said, we need nothing short of a total transformation of the energy system to underpin our economies. And as we know, three, three quarters of all global emissions are coming from the energy sector, fossil fuels. And as we think about another 2 billion people uh, between 2050 and 2100, that becomes even more critical. So things like the Keystone XL pipeline, the Line 3, Alberta tar sands, various offshore and public lands uh, leasing for oil and gas, which the Biden administration just announced a few hundred new leases are giving out. Possible exploration in the Arctic and is the Arctic ice melt. And all of those are dead end projects if you take these uh, recommendations seriously. And we also have to increase energy efficiency again, speaking to the technological alliance, um, at least four times more than we're doing now every year between now and 2030. And we need to be decreasing our energy production at the same time. So if, if we actually think we're in a climate emergency and the house is on fire and we're not dancing until the world collapses on us, um, we need to act like we're in a kind of emergency. And I want to talk about both institutional and personal aspects of that. So, for one thing, we need to start demanding that government stop all support for fossil fuels now that are things like subsidies, um, giving out new leases, and financing in various ways. Some of that um, may come out of the COP26, although I'm skeptical, we'll see. Um, there needs to be a much greater emphasis on things like upstream carbon taxes. So, there's currently proposals in the US Congress. To start with a fifty dollar um, per ton CO two tax, rising up eventually to three hundred per ton by twenty fifty, so kind of a scale to create growing incentives and costs um, on those end producers, and then also having a serious conversation about ending emissions trading, because as long as we can continue to pollute and trade those pollutions with other places, um, we're not addressing non emitting issues, and we also need massive investments at both the local, state, and federal as well global level, public and private partnerships on renewable energy. So think about what Denison's doing here with solar panel projects and the other similar examples. And we need something like a Green New Deal that focuses on both reforestation at a national and at a global level, more conservation and emphasis on and what does it mean to think about and put in place the just transition plan. And ultimately we have to have a serious conversation about um, if this model of extractive capitalism and neoliberal politics that got us to where we're at today continues to drive um, the UN, COP20, and other meetings, if we don't address that, uh, ultimately it's unclear to me and others that we're going to get to the root of these deeper questions. Um, and then I think the personal one is important, although I agree with what folks said here that ultimately some of these are bigger institutional challenges. And we do need to think about how we as individuals can reduce our carbon footprints our energy and water use, our transportation options, 
on food, as we heard we mentioned earlier, and our consumption. We need to think seriously about digesting from fossil fuels. So we're going to spend some good billion plus dollars down it, which is still in the process of today. And then having to do that with more sustainable projects. And we need to support politicians who are serious about taking climate action, and we need to hold those that are either denying or obstructing climate action. Joe Manchin of West Virginia being a classic example of the coal industry right now. And then make them pay politically for those decisions to not act on climate change. And then finally, because my background comes out of social movements and environmental politics, um, we need to have more serious conversations about using direct action to actually shut down these fossil fuel operations and related projects. And if companies continue to refuse to do anything um, to address the bigger climate issue, you can't just say, well, we'll hope corporations take these issues seriously and do something about it. And so that means looking seriously at the way that dark money groups like the Koch brothers and American Petroleum Institute can continue to forward efforts to try to address climate policy at the state level. As we're seeing in Ohio with SB6 and the corruption around subsidizing nuclear and full power plants. And as well as uh, national global level. So we need to think about these as individual as well as institutional actions and to take seriously these bigger kind of global messages that we're getting from the top and from all these various kind of folks. Thanks. Right. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> uh, Obviously, there's a lot for us to think about in these presentations. Um, there are some pretty depressing, so it gives us hope. Uh, I'm gonna, we have a mic on the two alleys, and you know, I'm just gonna put the stage open the floor. Um, as I said, there's many people in the audience who are to hear from students, and we'll also have questions from the webinar. So, yeah, yeah, about half an hour or so, maybe a little more. Or you know, hopefully a good vigorous discussion around the topic. Please introduce yourself with the direction of questions to operate your panel's resource, the entire panel. That's fine. Uh, okay, I'm uh, Eddie Stahl. I'm uh, not directly with any theoretical panel. Um, so I'm a history major. Uh, this is sort of how I think. Um, Yavala Murari, in his book, Sapiens of Brief History of Mankind noted that environmentalists and religious conservatives actually have a lot in common, except that they ask individuals to restrict themselves massively. Uh, especially in the Middle East, he compares environmentalists to religious conservatives and legal And he points out that the religious conservatives largely fake. Um, and they were asked for much more basic they asked people to not murder each other, not go on massive crusades and kill people. Stuff. They ask people to like restrain themselves with food and wealth and all these ways, and they fail. And they fail for thousands and thousands of years. And he notes that consumerism sort of became the only ideology that seems actually like fall, like not be like ideology in consistent time. So, given this massive history of failure, why do you think environmentalists will succeed where others have to, or if you believe that environmentalists will succeed? Or have hope that they will succeed where so many others have failed without the views. Thank you for that question. Um, <laughs> I don't know that any of us said that we believe that environmentalism will succeed. Um, I, I think I mean, that's what, that's why I ended my remarks with talking about tragedy. I, I think that although it is, I don't want to say that it's easy, right? It is possible for us to sit here and look at the, the data that we have, sketchy as it is, and say, here's why it's really bad. Um, I think the point, the things you point to are quite right. right? And I, I, mean, I, I think that it is very hard to motivate people to act. Um, it's very hard to get people to take anything other than their own self-interest seriously. Now, part of that is because our, you know, our culture produces us as individuals in a certain kind of way, and that there are very loud voices and very strong institutions that, that push us to think individualistically. Um, and so um, 
I, you know, I don't. I didn't hear anybody say, I think we're going to do this. I, I don't. I, I, I mean, I, I think I, I am very dark about the future. So, I mean, I don't really want to, want to be more optimistic about it. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm any more optimistic. Um, I, I, I mean, I sort of agree. It, it's hard to think about partly because it is a bummer, you know, and I think that, you know, it's like you, we can have wins or successes, but we're going to have to have a lot of su- like small successes to have kind of something that writ large is, I don't know if we can have success, but let's say minimizes damage from the current level of climate change and the ongoing effects from that that will continue even if everything zeroes out um, now, right? Um, And it's there are places that give me hope in the sense that, um, you know, among scientists, collaboration is stronger than ever in many areas. It's easier and more common to have these larger collaborations and collaborative networks that allow us to get more data, to do better analyses, to get better confidence in what it is that we are observing on the planet, whether that's biological or in the earth sciences or vice versa. But then translating those sorts of you know, successes maybe in the, in the process of how we get the data into policy change into economic change, cultural change, lifestyle change is really, really hard. And even if one country makes huge changes in all of those areas, there are a lot of countries in the world. There are a lot of different groups of people. And um, I don't know how much hope I have for that. Um, it's, yeah. So, I guess I tend to think about this in the sense that, as I kind of alluded to, that adaption is going to be the key for extending what we would consider what our whatever modern human society. Now, a hundred years from now, everybody's lifestyle might look very different than it does today, and there is the tendency, of course, over human lifespans to to be adverse to that sort of change. Now, when you look at the planet as a whole, I think that the Earth has seen more dramatic events in its climate than what it's experiencing right now. So when we're thinking about these issues, it's really looking at how our species and its current state is going to be able to adapt to new environments. And although it would be nice to slow that change down, change is going to come no matter what anyway. So we are just unfortunately in a place where we are dealing with self-inflicted change. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's a bummer. And that's kind of, you know, again, a lot of us said that. It's like, yeah, it sucks that there's a lot of things that we might like to do that we're not going to be able to do. And uh, people don't like to hear that. This whole pandemic has been all about people not doing things because they didn't want to change what they're doing. So that's, uh, humans are the, the probably, obviously the most complicated variable in this scenario. So I just, I would just add, I'm an, I'm an eternal optimist, but I'm also a skeptic. So, you know, thinking about the history of social movements, there's a, there's a period of time when, um, People could not imagine that black people could be even enslaved, or that women could have political rights, right? or that gay people could be married, or that there would be things like environmental regulation. <laughs> and so if we think at kind of at a longer historical perspective, I think there is a bit of hope for change. The question will be how much we can change and how fast we can change and whether we need to start you know, working on our primitive survival skills alongside our you know, climate adaptation skills. And I'm a big fan for that personally. But so I do see how, particularly in the young people today, the demands, you know, um, Fridays for the Future and other movements that are taking these issues seriously, the challenge is going to be, you know, how fast can we you know, force political change um, before things get beyond the point of being able to change. So I... I hear all the dire doom and gloom and um, wrestle with it myself sometimes, particularly thinking about 
religious politics and the end of the world and climate change. Um, but ultimately, I do think there is hope, but um, that window of hope is getting narrower and narrower each year. So the, the further we continue to delay, the harder we're going to have to push to get the changes we want to see. Thank you. Um, there is a couple of hands up. You can just walk up and we'll have a question from the webinar, which I bet you wants. Thank you. So I just sort of want to ask the question. You guys sort of talked a lot about how we need to make lifestyles and changes sort of overall as a society. We work with 50, 60 of us in the room, and there's probably 26, 27 other people on this campus. I sort of want to know how we convince people that climate goes along with these other socio-political issues that we face and sort of that you know uh you know the refugee crisis in syria isn't just refugee crisis a lot of that is product of climate change I really things like that so yes we can talk all day about uh changes we can make how do we catalyze that how do we do a more scale and I apologize if this seems flippant. Um, how do we convince half the population that getting a vaccine is a good thing to stop a disease? So that's where we are as a society right now. Um, I'll start with I think it's a great question. Um, COVID is a lesson. There was a spectacular <laughs> event that happened, right? Like the world got together, created a vaccine. I'm just wondering if the thing about the climate change process is that it's slow, it's gradual, it's not personal, right? I'm wondering if that is what it is what it's going to take to extend that system. But yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, if that answer, I do. I mean, I think it's a part but the other point, I mean, I do want to be able to see because we have two reasons that world. Um, so I want to get back to the first question and then the second. Uh, I think it's wrong to think that this is an environmental, environmentalist issue. So we tend to frame things as the same issue, but uh, we have to go above and beyond this frame. This is just something we have to deal with. And here's the reality. I mean, either we can have crisis, and just like every crisis, we can have different solutions. The problem with that is that some of these crises are going to become more and more difficult. But as we adapt to crisis, we adapt to the world, and the past world doesn't matter as much anymore. Okay, And we just figure out what is the reality we want to live in. Okay? I mean, so we create the world we want to, to live in. Um, and so I, I think it's, I mean, you know, whatever, I mean, social media is on the fire right now, and let's use it for good. I mean, this thing uh, as a messenger, you know, if you're uh, just, if you're engaged as one person doing something, you know, you, you have some a platform that none of us have when we were growing up, and you can actually just show the world what you're doing. This is all what social media is about. Is it? You know, there are many more ways to communicate about what's going on right now. Not doing it is finding an excuse not to do it in one place. So I want to sleep that on people who just say, uh, oh, should I do that? Well, that's not the right question to ask. I mean, this is about the life, but what can one like do? I mean, it's a question that all of us need to address and think about. Maybe we will answer that question differently, but. Um, so somehow in the way we have discourses with each other and discussion is to go out and answer this question. But okay, well, I don't want to leave where I kind of love to want to be there. What am I gonna do about it? Um and so of course if we're not optimistic about the world, then why do we keep the producing and so on and so forth? Right? I mean, so we have to find a way to, to be able to it. It's gonna be difficult, but I don't want to be pessimistic about that. Um uh, and so I, I like really just Frankly, I just want all of us here to stop finding excuses and just doing things. You know, we must just say, well, yeah, but my roommate isn't going to do anything about it. It's also big, just, just <laughs> all right? Mm -hmm. so let's not find excuses anymore. Thank you. All right. There was a hand up at the back. Um, yeah, you want to walk up and. Um, so I think 
people a lot of time explain making like a sustainable difference and sustainable changes as this really difficult thing that we haven't done before and that we don't have the infrastructure to do. But I feel like in our life and like everyone's life, like there's so many trends that happen. If you think about how like when the like the latest trend comes out, like all the factories they switch to doing whatever that is, right? Like like there's these massive changes we make in life every single day just based on the trends of the world, like and how it's going and what's popular and what people want now and what people feel is current. And our whole world like does backflips to accommodate that. So like what's the difference between between getting those things, those things that are popular, those things that are on trend and, and getting the things we need to live a more like sustainable lifestyle because we definitely can do it. I mean, like change is happening no matter what, right? Like, uh, like your the world's going to change a bunch tomorrow based on what people want tomorrow. You know, their own their own desires and their own needs. And I think enough people like want sustainability that that we can do this. And so, what's the difference between like making sure that tomorrow we make like the backflips and the change that we need to do to have a more sustainable life and and the difference between just, you know, whatever is popular and whatever people decide to want tomorrow. I don't know if that question is. Yeah. So here's one difference, right? Factories turn over what they're producing in response to expected profits. Um, and so the folks who own the factories, who run the factories, see an opportunity to make a lot of money. Um, and so they're willing to do things to make that money. Um, my, the hypothesis behind my talk is that one of the greatest problems we face now is our commitment to always making more, always making more money, always making more stuff. Um, and so the motivation, the, it's hard to see what the, like the, the motivation has to be somehow different to, right? Cause really it's not, if, right? So they're sort of, there, it certainly is the case that addressing climate change will require us to make a bunch of new things. It's going to require us to make many, many more solar panels. It's going to require us to make many, many more windmills. Um, it's going to require us to make um, many, many more bike lanes. It's going to it may, it may, may mean us taking single family homes and turning them into multi family dwellings. There definitely is going to be making and building that has to happen. But it, I think it also is going to require us to make a lot less stuff too, right? You know, so many people, they, they, here's the, I work on transportation and like this whole, like people say like, oh, aren't electric cars going to be so much better? I'm like, I don't know. Why would I believe that? Why would I believe that moving me in 3,500 pounds of electrically powered vehicle when that electricity is generated by burning coal is somehow better than my moving me in 3,500 pounds of gasoline or diesel power. Right? I don't see why that I think this is bad, why I should think this is better, right? And so I think a lot of the things that we have made a lot of, we're going to need to not make right now. How do we get to not making them, right? And, and that, that's the, I mean, I think that's the hard question, right? I mean, I do think it takes individual commitments, but it takes individual commitments to engage in collective political action and to, right? And it requires us all to think, like, am I, in what ways, in what ways am I complicit in the problem that I'm trying to solve? But that's hard. It's hard. To me, it seems like your answer to the question of, you know, why does why does one thing seem easy and the other thing seems so hard? Lies, you know, kind of what you said. This idea of motivation. Right. And what makes us motivated to do something is our kind of individual on a small scale, our cost benefit analysis, right? Like if I go buy this kind of fast fashion item, I get an immediate gratification <laughs> for benefit that I think I look good. I feel confident in that. I feel excited that I have something that's on trend or that it's new. We just like getting new things. There's a, a motivation for that. Right. So I think it's, and the cost is relatively low, right? I gave up $20 or $40 of my hard-earned money to do that. 
I'm continuing to make money. I'm getting more. So it's not a huge, a huge thing to do. Right. But if I want to do something that requires me to in turn, give something up, like give up that idea of fast fashion and say, <laughs> instead, excuse me, <laughs> instead I'm going to wear clothes for longer or learn to make my own clothes or modify my own clothes. That's it's reframing of what might make you happy or what might make you motivated or feel fashionable, but it's, you're also giving up time to do that. So you're giving up um, the instant gratification you're in for more of a delayed gratification of, of having to make something, you know, and, and on the large scale too, like if our economies are going to change, we have these kind of built in benefits of continued growth and continued um, investments and all of the things that come from always making more and doing more. And if we're going to make large changes, if we're going to stop mining coal, there are big costs with that. You know, we can sit here and say, well, that's going to have a huge benefit for the climate, but there are immediate and very painful losses. You know, thousands and thousands of people out of work, entire towns or sit or cities that maybe have completely crashed economies because of that. I mean, there is going to be loss and there is going to be tragedy. And I think that does make it, it makes it hard. It makes it hard to motivate that change. If there aren't other structures, I think, in place, like very strong um, social movements, possibly coupled with regulation, coupled with something else to redirect some of those losses or minimize losses. I'm not an economist or a policy wonk, but I, to me, those seem really key. For what makes it easier or hard? Um, I'm going to read a question from the webinar. This is from Thomas Henshaw. Here's the question. How are we defining success? <laughs> the continued existence of the human race? Question mark. The maintenance of current geopolitical boundaries and order? Question mark. That's the question. How are we defining success? I mean, I think this... You, Tom's question is uh, going to have a different answer depending on who you ask, because it's based strongly on what your sense of the world is. So, you know, many people are going to say that if we're going to do this, we need to be preserving, as uh, the uh, quote from the uh, George the Elder said, <laughs> preserving exactly the way of life that uh, we're used to. Um, I think that on um, you know the other end of the spectrum, obviously, it's like, do we is this the sort of event that's happening that's going to wipe out all humans on Earth? Probably not. Um, but that would be another end of the spectrum. Do we have a survivable <laughs> population of humans to persist? Um, but hopefully that's not the scenario we're heading towards. I think most people would argue that it would be a scenario where um, society is still uh, hopefully thriving a couple hundred, couple thousand years from now. Um, and that, uh, but it might, again, just be a very different sort of uh, society. I mean, that's a, those are very, very good questions. It's great to engage with that. This question is essential. And, um, yeah, I was actually going to mention also what you study with, which I think is part of the flag stars, are non negotiable. I mean, I'm with that. But, uh, but again, I want to get back to this notion of prices, right? Um, right now, for instance, we, you know, there's a big discussion of like labor shortages, right? And one of many different reasons behind that, but one of the reasons that people have had kind of space to think about their lives so the past year and a half and they want to make different decisions right so is this going to be a long-term change or not we, we don't know for sure but here's the like crisis which comprises the climate change with the climate and yet it has pretty dramatic impact on the world this is why i was saying that they're interested right i mean i if I could go back to 2019, yeah, we definitely do that. I'm going to go through the pandemic again. But 
And the way that people are, you can do all differently, just finding what they want with life in different ways and to whatever success is. And I think if we can do that in a couple of years, why, why even ask why we can do that with energy and we can do it? Um, and so that I think is very possible with the example here as well, water water issue, vaccination rates and all that. Um, but I think that creates hope that there's a potential to move forward. Uh, I think that's uh, that to me that's uh, uh, that's good. And yes, I mean I have to get to um, Sarah's point. I mean society economy is transformed all the time. And once you talk to economists, it's all a matter of who loses and who wins. We haven't done such a great job at looking at two terms of becoming changes over the past 30 or 40 years. Uh, that's kind of what led us to the world in 2015, 2016, 2017. <laughs> uh, now we're finally saying, oh, maybe we should pay attention. Um, and yeah, so that means looking at what government can do, what tools we have to kind of help guide in a particular direction. And we're going to have those, have to have those discussions that we stopped having in the 1980s. But maybe there's a window of hope here where we are having a, a discourse again where we say, yeah, this, there are some things we can do. There are ways in which we can. Uh, put some policies in place that might be helpful to the greater good and the common good. Then I think that's all we need to do. It's hope to be in some direction. Then you back to the very pessimistic person in the channel. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's not that, I think there are, there's some of that. So, especially if you can buy the number of other people, you have to be on the line. Counting on you, you know, uh, do the right things and putting us in our place and saying, hey, you're not for this, no more. Uh, if you want to be hopeful about the future, please be so. Please be hopeful. So one other sort of thinking about my discipline that we can sort of consider this issue is the fact that we can look at, at geologic crises that have happened, even going on right now. There is a big eruption going on on the Palma, the Canary Islands, and, and whole towns are getting buried by volcanic debris and lava flows. And a lot of the discussion when we talk to the people uh, there is how after the eruption's over, they can rebuild. Now, the first thing that, I mean, that's a that's an instinct to have because if that's what where your roots are, that's where your family is, it makes sense that once that disaster is done, once that disaster is done, uh, you will go back and live where you were before. Um, that, of course, then begs the question, this is a volcanic island. The volcano is going to erupt again. You're going to probably face this crisis again. It might not be in your lifetime, but it might be in your children's lifetime. But this is a recurrent theme we see across lots of different phases of, of human existence. There are great um, stories, uh, archaeological evidence that uh, during the large earthquake that happened in 1700 in the Cascades, that uh, Native American villages on the Oregon and Washington coast that were inundated by tsunamis, um, many people died, many people got out of the way. They told the stories of these tsunamis, but archaeologically, the evidence is that people moved straight back down uh, within years after that tsunami to the places that had been destroyed. Because I think we are somewhat in this room probably biased to be people who are looking to go to different places, to change our lifestyles, to do things that are different rather than cultures that uh, want to remain connected to the place that they, they're from. And this is one of the biggest issues we face in Ge geologic hazard mitigation is convincing people not only that a hazard is real, but returning to places might not be the best the best solution. Uh, the last example I'll give you with is uh, in Chile, there was an eruption in 2009 that uh, uh, mud flows destroyed a whole town. The Chilean government said, all right, we're going to rebuild, but we're going to rebuild away from where this was likely to happen. And a majority of the people who lived in that town said, no, I don't want to, you to rebuild in this new place. I want it in the same place it was before. So those sorts of instincts might not be 
what we we in this room might be experiencing, but it is something that I think is very real for a lot of sort of cultural, other cultural situations. I think this question might count. So I'm gonna just say it's on the sort of in part responding to Eric here. Um, you know, I mean, I think if we want to talk about success, success has to mean as well success for whom, um, right? And I think a country like the United States, which is an incredibly wealthy country, um, despite some of the inequities in distribution of that wealth and inequities in distribution of income. Um, may well be quite resilient. Um, I think the Dutch are, I, I wouldn't want to say that the Dutch are excited about climate change and raising sea levels, but the Dutch have for hundreds of years been very good at seeing business opportunities, and nobody is better at managing water than the Dutch. And they expect to make tens or hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars for Europe. Um, off of other people's looking to them for, oh, what are we going to do with Boston? What are we going to do with New York? I can't remember who had the map of Florida. And so, but that's is that some of the about the refugee crisis that, that people leave people only very reluctantly leave where they are, and they leave where they are because of war, because of famine. But there are large parts of the planet which are expected to become uninhabitable in the coming decades, right? Because they will, some of them will have simply disappeared because of rising water. So like the entire country of Bangladesh may more or less disappear. Much of the state of Florida may well disappear. Entire island nations may disappear. Um, and and, and we can't um, we can't reasonably say to somebody whose country has ceased to exist, how dare you be a refugee and show up on my doorstep? Um, and so these refugees will be showing up more and more and more. You can't rebuild in the place where you were if it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and, and so one of the things that I mean, one of the, we like to we're, we're very good at pointing fingers at other people. Right? So one of the, one of the big the big um, fingers of shame that we point these days is that China. Look at the Chinese. They're building all of these coal-burning power plants. And what are they thinking? And how are they doing this? Right? China is and has been for many decades an export-driven economy. You know, the stuff the Chinese are burning coal to build is our stuff. Not, in fact, not all of it, but a lot of it is that, you know, we're buying stuff made in China, and so they're burning coal. And, and, and so when we point, oh, look at the Chinese, it's like, who's buying the Chinese stuff? Right? And so it has to be the question, not just like, what is success? It's like, you know, there are going to be winners and losers. And I, I really do think that if we're going to be winners, we have a moral responsibility to make sure that the losers are looked after too. Um, because the truth is that the, the carbon that's in the atmosphere and the nothing that's in the atmosphere is produced by wealthy people. And, and I don't mean Bill Gates. Right? I mean, in the global sense of wealthy, if you're in this room, you're probably wealthy. Not all of us, but most of us are wealthy from a global perspective. And it's our actions that are, that are causing this to happen. And we have to be the ones to step up. Thank you, Dr. Uh, we are kind of touching on our finish time. If there's any last question from the audience, <coughs> please hear from me. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, yes. um, given that this reality is kind of imminent and that the slide shows that the future is of construction and the future of how is the future of all going to happen, would like to not. How can people in my friends say I'm one years old, you know, a lot of people are like, eight times? Um, how can we maintain a positive conscience that we list? Is that the number of incredibly professionals? And what can everyone say? Like, what do you think? Like, how are we all going to be okay? And when the reality is that things aren't, so I guess how can we, um, what kind of generation have we adopted? Like, what do we have to do? Is there a lot of things that things happen? You guys kind of had a very pessimistic you know, so far, and um, uh, you think it was that. I 
So just to, to date me, uh, I grew up in a time where we spent a lot of uh, brain power thinking about the fact that at any given moment we could be nuked by uh, Russia and Russia or the Soviet Union, excuse me, and vice versa. And that, you know, there was a lot of that ingrained Cold War fear that we were at the brink of total annihilation every day. This is not to say that, um, I guess what I'm saying is dramatic things happened that reduced that threat rapidly. The threat is still there. Other nations are have developed nuclear weapons. Um, who knows what Vladimir might decide to do. But that same existential threat has changed because of dramatic change that happened in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union at the beginning of the 90s. So, and that was work that had, it was people in those countries that brought about that change. So I guess what I'm saying here is that although we can, it's very easy to fall into that pit of saying that everything is bad in the future and how are we ever going to get out of it? The cons, the, the need to work for, to continue to move forward will not be one where we necessarily see a constant uphill progress, but it could come just in sort of dramatic moments. So that's, that's kind of my take on this. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good question. I mean, clearly we all have ups and downs with feeling mm -hmm. like the world is burning or maybe it's going to be okay, or maybe some parts of it are going to be okay. I mean, it's, it's a hard thing to really grapple with. I think that it's a question I ask myself a lot, like how, how do you work in this area? How do you be a human being in this time and not just despair or give up? Um, I do think that part of it requires having a somewhat realistic outlook on what are the possible futures. And so I think, you know, if you're defining quote success as uh, I wish climate change wasn't happening or I, I wish we could, that it would just stop immediately and think we could just stabilize the climate now, um, then you will despair, right? There will be no hope because it's just not, it, that's not a realistic future to look towards. It's, you know, in a temporal sense, the same idea of you can't go back sometimes to a place that doesn't exist anymore. There's a certain amount of what has happened baked into what the future of the planet will be. And so reframing kind of the position on which you, you wish to have hope on, you know, within the realistic futures, how, how can people come together to minimize continued changes and learn to adapt within those changes is, is what will be necessary. And I, I think reframing it to that versus how do we stop this immediately um, then provides maybe some more avenues for thinking about, you know, what can be done, where, where are the places where we can start to accrue more of these smaller successes in cultural or lifestyle changes, or, you know, I'm thinking about the natural world and there are some species we've lost already. Species are moving, but that doesn't mean they're going extinct everywhere. But things will be different. We've learned to live with nuclear weapons on the planet. We are going to have to live with COVID on the planet. They're not going back. They're not going away. There, there may be ways we can learn to live with climate change that has happened and will continue to happen and minimize kind of those more dramatic changes. It's a good question. Sorry. Um, your ancestors probably going back to a point where you don't know who they were anymore. You were born into times of pestilence, you were born into times of plague, you were born into times of war, you were born into times of authoritarianism, you were born into times of you know, the divine right of kings and the king to do whatever. Like, you know, most of us are descended from, from peasants in various places who lived really, really hard and terrible lives. And so I think part of the, the sadness of, and a part of what I worry about is, is, is you know, I, I like, I like, I used to read a lot of science fiction and watch a lot of science fiction films. And there's this question about like, 
which one of these is the future that we're facing, right? They're all very different. Um, and a lot of them are really dark. Um, and so I, I think it is worth our taking time to think about what matters to us and what 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 we love about the world and what we love about human culture and what we love about nature and, and to say, well, what what would it look like to live a life where I'm committed to those things? Right? And that might mean living a life very different from the one that you might be led to leave to live, sorry. Uh, if your thinking was about, you know, well, I want to build a company and I don't care what the company makes. I just want to build a company, right? I just, right. So if you think, well, you know, what matters to me is that there be a, a culture that supports artistic freedom or a culture that supports science or, you know, I worry a lot about religious fundamentalism and its political power. Right? So, well, I don't want to live in a place where that is, and I don't want to live in a, in, that kind of place right and so well, what matters to me and how could i make how could i live in a way and how could i encourage others to live in a way that keeps the world or makes the world the way i wish it were and i think that can be with a recognition that you'll probably fall very very short of achieving what you want but that, that you're trying to do that makes it like you So I, I would say a couple of different things. So I remember when I was 22 in uh, 1999, a bunch of us all said, we need to think about globalization differently. We went to Seattle, we shut down the WTO meeting, and we changed the discussion about globalization um, at the end of the 1990s. Climate justice movements today, um, indigenous rights movements, the Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement, um, Sindignados, the peasant movements around the world, all these things give me hope for the challenges that we're facing um, are opportunities to think about how do we create a better, different world. And so I don't see them as necessarily, um, they're negative, but they're also places where we know that if we mobilize people and think differently and bring different creative energies and different political pressures, then we can also make changes to those areas. And so, I would say to the young people out there, I still like to think of myself as a young person, although every year it gets a little bit harder to make that argument. <laughs> you know, that part of our challenge as young people is to push the generation ahead of us to be more accountable and to bring a different vision of the future that's more optimistic and doesn't settle for you know, the business as usual politics and says, no, we can do better. We can um, have more, not in the more stuff sense, but more in a richer, more fuller life. You know, that we can enjoy the sunset. We can enjoy the full moons. We can enjoy walking in the DU biosphere um, reserve or in Sugarloaf or along the Rocky Creek or just around town or, you know, with our friends having a potluck at the homestead, whatever it might be. You know, there are lots of opportunities to come together to create community and to create a different vision of a new world. And as long as you have that kind of fire in your belly, um, that gives you the you know, motivation and the power to not only see a different world, but then to try to put that in action and to you know, precisely use that collective mobilization, social movements and you know, familial and other kinship relations to make that you know, vision of a different future more of a possibility and not just a, a pie in the sky. So as long as young people continue to dream for a better future, um, I think there will always be the energy to try to bring about um, progressive uh, spirit of social change as it were so i think the fact that you're asking that question is itself already part of the step and that you know young folks need to continue to be doing and having and talking about and that we're doing this too right in the universe environment is part of that story right the fact that we're having these conversations speaks to the importance and the interest in these issues so i think that's important to note as well great question thank you thank you those those are some very helpful, like, optimistic and positive responses. Um, we are significantly over time, but that's a mark of how interesting this event has been. I'm going to read one last comment, uh, unless there's something else from the audience. This is also from Tom Henshaw, and he's pointing us to a couple of texts. Um, uh, 1957, The Hidden Persuader, and 1960, The Wastemaker. So he's saying that none of these concepts 
I guess he means concepts of happiness, joy, or all of this are intrinsic, they're driven by consumer demand and by projection of normative needs. So I guess to extend that point, maybe as a culture, we need to really find our notion of happiness and that there's nothing intrinsic about being happy, watching or being in a shiny metal object moving at a certain speed, right? Um, you know, looking for happiness in other things. I mean, that is, you know, there's nothing internally biological about being happy about that, right? It is something that we learn in culture. Maybe that is the other place to also think about that we need to reorient and look for happiness and other things and we look inside instead of the external material world and the world of consumption. So, um, unless there are other questions, I don't want to shut anyone out. I think we've all really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I'm going to just ask the audience member to give a huge round of applause to our five. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's a very busy time of semester, so thanks for the time out there. Of course, we thank all of them, and hopefully, we will continue this conversation in other venues because this issue is not going away. Thank you to all of you for coming. Thanks.